briefly give an introduction myself. My name is Jeff Harvey, and I'm a, well, as it says on here, you can read it, senior scientist at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology. We're right across the road from Bavian University. And um, I'm also at the moment a visiting professor at the Free University in Amsterdam, the group of Jacinta Ellers and Maddie Berg. And uh, I got my PhD way, way back, way, way back in 95 at the University of Liverpool. I studied parasite host interactions. And I did postdocs, one in, Amer in the US with uh, Mike Strand in Wisconsin, another one with Louisa Vett at, the, uh, at Wageningen University. And I was briefly an editor at Nature, but while I was there, Louisa was appointed director of the Institute uh, where I am now working. She offered me a senior scientist position. This is like 23 years ago. So I've been here ever since. And uh, my work has covered a lot of different stuff. I worked on multi-trophic interactions, plant insect interactions, a lot on parasitoid biology and ecology, but in more, uh, I started to get more into global change issues about 15 years ago with looking at, uh, for example, uh, the role of invasive plants and how they affect native insects. And then uh, thanks to a colleague, Maddie Thakur, and then one of my PhD students, uh, Robin Hyden, I began studying climatic extremes and how they affect uh, insects physiologically uh, and behaviorally, uh, uh, ecologically, et cetera. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about, again, this is similar to a talk I gave last year at the International Congress of Entomology in Helsinki. And it was about, again, how climate extremes can affect uh, insects and other arthropods. Now, I guess we are, all of us here are in this group are pretty much in a consensus that insects are undergoing a downward spiral as evidence increasing that insects uh, across different taxonomic groups are in decline. Some groups are being more negatively affected than others. Again, this is a revision for many of you, but certainly it's a concern because of, of course, the effects this is gonna have on, uh, not only on uh, aesthetically, of course, but on ecosystem functioning and on critical ecosystem services like pollination, like pest control, like nutrient cycling. But insects, you know, they're just wonderful things to have around. You know, as, as, a, as an aspect of biodiversity, I love them. I've loved them since I was a little kid. And now I'm 65 years old, I love them more than ever. And I think that again, their loss is gonna have huge societal and economic implications. And Dave, I think he's, he's on the, one of the people attending this, his book, which is a fantastic book, I've read it, Silent Earth, is a, a kind of a, a roadmap to how we can avoid the insect apocalypse, but the book is a wake up call, as Isabella Tree says, to the plight that we face, that insects, and not only insects, I'm gonna specify here, less well-studied groups like spiders and myriapods are also, ar arachnids are also declining. And the consequences are pretty serious if we don't find a way to arrest these declines and reverse them. We need to bend the curve, it seems to be the common phrase these days in talking about global change. And Sanchez Bio, I spelled this wrong, she's Bio and Wickhouse in Biological Conservation in 2019. This was a criticized paper, but I think the thrust that came out of it is still pretty robust. And that is that insects, if many groups, especially caddisflies, beetles, mayflies, are declining rapidly and have been declining certainly over the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, the work has been uh, accentuated by studies since, by meta-analyses, by Ben Klink's work, by work by, uh, by others, the famous uh, paper by Casper uh, Hallman et al., we're seeing insects declining across a number of taxonomic and functional groups. And, you know, Sanchez, Bio, and Wickhouse, uh, in their paper, they argued that insects may be declining faster than many well-studied vertebrate groups, including amphibians, reptiles, birds. We certainly know that well-studied groups are in decline. There's no reason to think that insects are exempt from anthropogenic stresses, so we're losing them. And the big consideration now is what the consequences are likely to be. We pretty well know that there's multiple anthropogenic causes. I'm gonna focus on one, probably one that is of less importance than say land use change and the profligate use of pesticides. But still climate change is part of the mix as we, you know, as when we go on from Sanchez Bio and Wickhouse, we also show that for example, the percentage of decline of different groups is, is, uh, is uh, variable but some groups are really declining rapidly. Now, this was a paper by Dave uh, Dave and his and several colleagues. And I think it's one of the most important papers that's been 
Understanding Insect Declines. It's been published in the last 20 years. This was the paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, death by a thousand cuts, each cut representing an anthropogenic stressor. And uh, of course, all of these include land use changes, habitat loss, invasive species, climate change, climatic extremes, uh, the use again of pesticides, all of these factors in combination in synergy, additively or synergistically are causing insects to decline across the biosphere. Now, most of the evidence at the moment, we've got fragmentary evidence, but it's growing. We're getting more and more studies coming in from tropical biomes. We certainly know from well-studied temperate biomes that a number of insects, taxa and insect functional groups are declining. And it's something we have to take seriously as scientists and that we have to communicate to society like, like David is doing and certainly that Dave Goulson has been doing with his work and with his public lectures and with his, uh, with his recent book. Now, I focus a lot on climate change, you know, I'm focusing on this, even though, as I said, it's just what one cut amongst a thousand. But we do know that if we look at between the uh, 2011 to 21 average, and we compare that with the baseline temperature, we're seeing that the biosphere is warming. And it's warming in some places very rapidly. Obviously, as you get more polewards, because of circulation models, and because of the movement of air masses towards the poles, we're finding it's warming the farther north or south you get, certainly towards the Arctic, it's been warming, but we're also seeing rapid warming across parts of temperate regions and tropical regions. And of course, this warming is well outside of natural forcings. And it's something that poses a grave threat to biodiversity at all levels of organization. And, you know, climate models may be underestimating the actual uh, rate of warming. You know, we're actually seeing that the climate models are predicting that warming at a certain rate. The IPC has a specific projection, but again, we're seeing in various regions, climate warming at a, at a far faster rate than even the models have been suggesting. And of course, attendant with climate change, as I'll explain in a moment, are climatic extremes like heat, drought, flood, and fire, something I've been, been writing about recently. And these, uh, short-term stresses combined with a longer-term incipient warming pose different kinds of threats to insects and biodiversity. One of the arguments we can say, of, of course, of warming is that you might get an increase in crop losses due to insect pests. Now, this is what in our recent paper in Global Change Biology, which I'll talk about in a moment, we talk about climatic extremes and climate warming. Well, climate warming will lead, for example, to more overwintering ranges further north or south polewards. So insects that were used to be killed by winter, for example, in Europe, the diamondback moth did not survive where I am in the Netherlands until the late 1990s. Now it emerges earlier in the year and it reaches pest numbers at a much earlier time during the growing season. So we expect that maybe warming will increase the ability of insects to, over, uh, to have more generations per year. As this has been said, uh, they're going to be, uh, uh, insects will build up their populations faster as ectotherms. And of course, this will lead to a potential of increased pest loads in cropping systems. And this was projected in the same study that I just pointed out, that the, lot, the effects on wheat, rice, and maize might be stupendous um, because of, guess, of insects benefiting from a warming climate. And of course, the paper by Askendich and insects uh, and colleagues in insects in 2021 argued that insects, that warming will lead to more generations, an increase in the, in the expansion of the uh, geographic range, plant-borne diseases will be increased, you'll get increased overwintering survival, and then you get maybe desynchronization with natural enemies like parasitoids and predators. And of course, these, these alterations, including the loss of synchrony with the host plant, are gonna have all kinds of ecological consequences, both from top-down effects and bottom-up effects. But of course, as I said, Climate change and incipient warming are just one side of the climate change coin. The other ones are heat waves, floods, droughts, and, uh, and fires and attendant events that can have very short-term impacts on insect populations. So insects may be able to respond by altering aspects of their life cycle and life history in response to gradual warming, but in response to extreme conditions, they have to ride it out. And many cannot ride it out. You know, we had a heat wave in the Netherlands just... Uh, four years ago where it hit 40 degrees, it hit 40 in the UK last year. And 
these are insects are just not adapted to those kinds of temperatures. We should receive them about once every, according to one climate scientist, it hit, should hit 40 degrees in the Netherlands once every 20,000 years. And yet it hit it in 2019. Last year, we just missed it. In Maastricht, it hit 39.5 while it was over 40 in the UK. So we can expect the frequency and duration and intensity of these extreme events to increase in a warming world. And insects being ectotherms are often, in many cases, poorly adapted to ride out climate extremes. Now, as I'm going to explain a little bit later, it seems from my work in Cyprus that I'm doing that the distribution of insects, to many extent, their northern and southward distribution is limited by minimal temperatures, but their local distribution abundance is determined to a large extent by upper temperature limits, thresholds, critical thermal limits. So, you know, temperature, climate change and climatic extremes operate over different time scales and exert different stresses in insects and other arthropods. Longer term increases in surface temperature challenge insects to alter various aspects of their life history, such as seasonal phenology, uh, distribution, and others to track resources and avoid suboptimal temperatures and distribution. Short term climatic extremes, such as heat waves, pose immediate threats to insect survival or reproductive capacity. And I'll get to a little bit more about that in a minute. Other anthropogenic stresses that David and colleagues talk about in the uh, Thousand Cuts paper amplify the deleterious effects of climate change and climatic extremes or actually act in, in, to amplify them. So, you know, we're, insects aren't just facing one threat, they're facing multiple threats. And we have to deal with these because if you ignore one and you focus on maybe one or two others, insects are still gonna decline. We have to find ways to make the world a friendlier place uh, for insects. And as I think as um, uh, 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 several authors have written, Dan Jansen recently said it last year, we have to be kind to the survivors. And to be kind to the survivors, we have to create an environment and we have to deal with issues that are actually going to protect insects from multiple stressors. And this was a CNN graph that showed that again, climate exchange, as the increase and temperature occurs, you get more hot weather events, more extreme hot weather events, more droughts, and of course, breaking those droughts, more extreme heavy rainfall events, and you get less cold and less extreme cold weather and climate. Now, these are three papers that I, I led in recent years, and I think they deal with the issue. Two focus on it, one is more general. The one in the upper right, and, and David has co-authored these, and a number of you probably there have been co-authors on, on these papers. Uh, the first one was to look at a roadmap for insect conservation and recovery that takes into account the multiple stressors, the thousand cuts, the different cuts, and to find a way. The other two focus more on climate change, climatic extremes, and how they affect insects right from the bottom up, right from the level of physiology of individuals, behavior of individual organisms, right up to community level processes. And this is a lot of what I'm doing now. This is this focus a lot of what my research is based on at the moment at the NEO. Now this chart was this was part of the paper that we had published earlier this year in Ecological Monographs, and it was written by uh, Steve Chown and colleagues. And we talked about climate change, gradual long-term extreme events, and how we can intervene to, to mitigate them. The long-term effects again are on rain shifts, phenology and species interact interactions. The extreme events, which I've pointed out, will affect immediately affect individual fitness. It will affect the efficacy of pathogens, the, the food sources like plant food or uh, prey or hosts for predators and parasites. It will, if we get too high, it will affect not only survival, but of course, fertility. We're working at the moment in my lab, for example, on how uh, exposure to heat affects reproduction in spiders, which transfer sperm from the gonopore to a sperm web, and then they in, insert it into the female ep epigyne. And we're seeing how spider fertility may be affected by exposure to heat events. And of course, we have to think about concomitant and sequential extreme events, like going from a heat wave and a drought to a, an extreme rainfall event caused by convection as a cold front goes through and then building up to heat again. And these multiple events challenge insects to survive. And of course, the paper also talks about management strategies, how we can involve the public and how we can buffer ecosystems to make them more climate friendly or climate resilient. And I'll talk a little bit about that now because we have to focus on again, when we talk about gradual warming and short-term climatic extremes, we're going from macroclimate to microclimate. Macro is the overall climate of a region 
that covers a large geographical area. It might include, include, cover a biome, an entire biome or a large scale ecosystem. But micro scales, the climate of a very small area or a restricted area, especially when this differs from the climate of the surrounding area. And as I'm going to explain a little bit later on, some of the work I'm doing in Cyprus shows that you can get a temperature difference of about 40 degrees over about a two meter uh, gradient, spatial gradient. And of course, that's the difference between life and death for an invertebrate, for an ectotherm. Now, some work I did with uh, Rita Halls and colleagues, we published in Journal of Thermal Biology over the course of a growing season in 2020, we did experiments uh, in some, you can see on the left, this was a biodiversity experiment involving native and range expanding plants. And we start with bare soil and over the course of the growing season at different air temperatures, we actually looked at the edge temperature. So we measured temperature in the middle of these plots and at the edges over the course of a uh, summer and during cooler periods and during very hot periods. And we found that the warmer the air temperature was, the more the extreme temperature between the middle of the vegetation and the edge grew. It got to the point where if the temperature in the vegetation was like in the low 30s C, it could be as high as 50 or 55 degrees at the edge. And we did this especially during a very strong heat wave in the Netherlands where the temperature was up in the upper 30s. The temperature at the edge of the plot was over 50. And at the, in the center of the plot, in the middle of the vegetation, it was in the low 30s. And of course, this is where insects need to ride out. They, you know, if they remain active and they start moving around into areas where it's extremely hot, this could kill them or it could sterilize them. You know, the critical thermal limit for insect survival and for reproduction is often very different. So it might be that you've got the living dead. The insects are still alive. This is work that late Matt Gage did with flower beetles and they found when exposed to heat that flower beetles, the males often survive, but they were rendered sterile and they were still mating with females and, and injecting dead sperm into them. And the females were unable to reproduce. So you've got a situation where the insects are alive but they're effectively dead because they're unable to, to reproduce. And this is something we're really concerned about. We're seeing it more with butterflies, that the eggs are also destroyed in the female reproductive tract if they're exposed to extreme heat, and that sperm is very susceptible in insects to heat. <clears throat> so it's not just the death of insects we have to worry about, it's, it's their actual sterilization. And work by my colleague, Maddie Thakur and colleagues was published uh, last year. And he actually did a meta-analysis looking at the effects of extreme heat events on microbes, plants, invertebrates, and vertebrates. And he focused on in the invertebrates, which is of interest to us. He looked at parasoroids, insect herbivores, decomposers, columbols, and also he looked at nematodes. And he found that in almost every case of this, these are published studies, the effects were negative. So an extreme climate event exposure, and he focused on heat again, led to a negative response. We need more studies, we haven't got enough. Most of the work has been done with plants, but of course, if plants, which really suffer from negative effects, especially uh, forbs and, uh, and, uh, and uh, shrubs, what it, if they're gonna be negatively affected, it's gonna work its way up to the food chain and affect invertebrates as well. Even if it doesn't have a direct effect, it'll have a direct effect on the resources. And so of course, we have to consider this too. But this was a very important paper and he's building on this, Maddie. We're, we're working right now at the moment on a manuscript on thermal adaptation in spiders and wolf spiders to exposure to climate extremes. Another study by Weaving in Nature Communication, a very important one, looked at the actual effect, the plasticity of insects to respond to maximal temperatures and to minimum temperatures. And what they found was as the temperature gets warmer, there are, the insects are able to respond to a critical thermal min, minimal with more plasticity than a max temperature. In other words, they are negatively affected. Their survival and fecundity is negatively affected as at higher temperatures more than at lower temperatures. There seems to be more plasticity at lower temperatures to be able to respond than when it gets too hot. And Nature Climate Change had a paper by Duffy et al published in 2022, just less than a year ago, where climate mediated shifts in temperature fluctuations promote extinction risks. And especially insects like bees, bumblebees, are very sensitive to extreme heat. A couple of years ago, they had this extreme heat wave in Western North America, 
and it hit in record temperatures. In Canada, they broke their old uh, temperature record national by about five degrees. It hit almost 50 in Southern British Columbia. And there was a biologist who was walking through Montana, looking at the dead vegetation, the vegetation had shriveled. And she said it was like walking amongst the, you know, the, if this is the future we're projecting, it's a very worrying one because everything was dead. The plants were all dead, the flowers had, had withered. And of course there was no insects to be seen. And of course, this is working its way up through the food chain. So this is the kind of climatic extreme events that we're, in, you know, that we're inflicting on the biosphere and the effects are likely to be very serious for all levels of biodiversity. But of course, they'll work their way from the bottom up as well. A study by Hervord and Segro and Nature Communications in 2021 showed also, and this is reflecting what Daniel Jansen said last summer at ICI, that insects that are adapted to temperate biomes because the temperature variability is much greater, they're able to respond more adaptively. So their populations can respond to climatic extremes much more than tropical species, which are maybe near their thermal limit and very much less adapted to a variable level of temperatures. And they found this in, in temperate and tropical Drosophila, but as the average temperature increased, they disappeared more rapidly than the temperate species did. Probably again, because temperate species are more thermally plastic and can respond to these much more better than tropical species, which are again, adapted to a narrow window. And when that window starts to reach the ceiling, they die much more rapidly than species in temperate biomes, which can tend to either move around or physiologically respond to it. And in the same study, they showed about a seven degree thermal difference in vulnerability in species of Drosophila that are found in, in uh, temperate zones. But as you get more towards tropical species and lower species are more in the Southern biomes, you get that this buffering decreases a little bit between minimal thermal temperatures, critical thermal limits and upper thermal limits. Now, this is from the paper with it, me and uh, Maddie, Robin Heiden, and Rita Calls published in Global Change Biology three years ago. And what we also came up with was the idea that you're going to see effect size plus a negative of extreme events <clears throat> on different fitness related parameters. And this will affect phenology and behavior. So that's on the left side of the upper graph. And on the right, we have to look at negative effects that are going to work their way on plants, herbivores, and their natural enemies up to the fourth trophic level. But what we basically argue in this paper, and we call it from outbreaks to breakdowns, is you will get outbreaking events. So for example, an insect might be freed of its natural enemies, which are more sensitive to higher temperatures. So a single uh, uh, temperature extreme will cause a breakout of insects, but then this will be destabilizing because it will affect their plants. They may overexploit their plant resource and crash, or if there are repeated climatic extreme events, they're not physiologically adapted to cope with multiple extremes. So if you get repeated temperature extreme events, you get breakdowns. So the breakdown scenario uh, increases, the threshold towards breakdowns increases as you increase the number of temperature extreme events. And uh, what it does essentially, it dissociates, it breaks apart trophic interaction webs. And of course it creates physiological extreme uh, stresses on all the organisms, but especially higher up the food chain. They're more sensitive. And as you get lower down the food chain, they're less sensitive. But if they're exposed to these temperature extremes repeatedly, it will eventually negatively affect them, as well as their, of course, their uh, resources, their food plants they feed upon. And there have been attempts to talk about also, we talk about climatic, climate change and climatic, uh, you know, we talk about also conservation. The Wildlands Network that the late Michael Soule postulated, we talked about, of course, dispersal for organisms across large biomes, focusing on wolves and mountain lions and organisms. The Wildland Network aimed to work with federal agencies in North America and private landowners to create corridors for the dispersals of, again, species that require large expanses of land in which in order to, uh, to persist. And that is focusing on predators like wolves and mountain lions and maybe bears as well, grizzly bears. But, but of course, we have to start thinking about microclimates for insects, not only macroclimates and things as dispersal. So species need to disperse. One of the we also have in Europe, we have also this, uh, this uh, 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 European Wilderness Society, which has been talking about species exchanges, movements across different corridors, 
because in Europe, our ecosystems are as fragmented, if not a lot more than in North America. And of course, for a species to, uh, to adjust its distribution, if it has to cross an urban or agricultural expanse, it's very difficult. But of course, not only do we have to focus on, again, macro habitat relocation, if it gets too warm, but we have to think about these extremes. And of course, if a species has to disperse across a landscape, it's not so easy when you've got an effective biological desert like this. A field like this is a biological desert. You know, you might be able to get maybe some ants and other uh, smaller species and species living in the soil, but for large dispersing organisms, you could talk about birds, you can talk about mammals, but also for butterflies and organisms that are more motile, this is still, there's nothing there for them to feed. There's no food resources. There's no protection against climatic extremes. There's very little protection against larger natural enemies. And this is the kind of landscape we're creating. And we have to start thinking differently. We have to start thinking more like this. We have to start thinking that, first of all, we've got, when you talk about set aside and you've got land, even in urban areas like here, where you allow the uh, a wide variety of plants and flowers to proliferate, you not only provide provisioning in terms of pollen and nectar, but you also have nice embedded microclimates down below, like I showed before in that study with Rita Halls and colleagues, where if it gets too hot, insects and other invertebrates can ride it out by going at the basal part of it, where the temperature is buffered to some extent against extremes. Because again, you've got many forest ecosystems. It's like this near where I live. You've got beach forests where there's no understory at all. And of course, not only are these kind of biological deserts, but they're kind of like, again, habitats of the living dead. We have to start thinking again about forest ecosystems and encouraging undergrowth in terms of undergrowth, in terms of, again, for microclimates and food provisioning for insects and other invertebrates. And this will maintain a healthy multi-trophic system. And this is something that often city urban managers and city landscapes, I've gone into parks and cities and they're like, again, they're like this. You go into a park and it's all right if you want to walk your dog, but if you want to have biodiversity, encourage biodiversity, you're not going to get anything. You're going to get very little. You might get maybe a few birds nesting in the trees, but we've got to start encouraging more landscapes like this and focusing on understory. Instead of just having trees, but focusing on creating a vegetation rich mosaic, which is very useful for, again, riding out climate extremes, but also provisions insects. Because of course, if you look at many of our agricultural areas in the UK, we've been, they've been losing hedgerows, they've been being pulled up. And it's the same in the Netherlands. We don't really have a landscape of hedgerows. I'm working on a local thing called Mass Hagen, which means mass hedges along the river Mass. And we're trying to find out how important these hedgerows are and their specific directional orientation for insect conservation and for arthropod conservation. Because again, to increase the amount of area in which we grow crops, we've been ripping up hedgerows without understanding the potential costs for insects and invertebrates as refuges. So again, this is the kind of hedgerows and field margins, for example, if you've got, a, uh, you've got a, 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 a mustard crop or whatever, but hedgerows can provide huge micro, amount of microclimates and refuges. The, at the Mass Hagen a couple of years ago, for example, along the hedges, we had a flood, a once in a thousand year flood of the Moss when they had incredible heavy rain in Germany. It was in the news a lot. And the Moss flooded to a meter deep. And we're finding in our research right now that the insects that, that survived the floods were mostly insects that were carabids, for example, that were able to fly. The flightless carabids were pretty well extirpated locally after that flood. It was a kind of inadvertent experiment that we didn't expect, a treatment. But we got this flood and the water was a meter, a meter and a half deep for about three weeks. And it doesn't usually happen. So these are the kinds of habitats we need to create. Again, like these, we have hedgerows, we have floral margins. We have areas where insects can seek, uh, especially when insects that are able to are motile and able to move around. Uh, refuges during extreme events, uh, whether it's uh, extreme heat or extreme doubt, and also there's food provided, there's provisioning that the insects have a source of, uh, especially the herbivorous insects, but also the parasitoid wasps have an, a, a source of nutrients for this. And again, we have to think about 
microclimates can affect, you know, air temperature can have, these are all connected, soil moisture, soil temperature, wind speed and direction, air humidity, the landscape structure, all these, this is a fairly complicated informative graph. I don't expect you to take it all in, but all these things are connected and we have to think about that when we're talking about conserving insects and helping them to ride out extreme events. This was in the paper, the, uh, the, the, on the left, we have the chart for the roadmap to insect conservation and recovery and the kind of immediate actions, the no regret solutions, the midterm actions that we can take and the longer term action to monitor insects and to see how they are responding to these events. And on the right, we have the paper from the ecological monographs one. And again, these are insect destructive environmental features, the ones with minimal vegetation, concrete services, that we try to keep the environment tidy, uh, fertilizer application, pesticides, and we have to start thinking about insect supportive environmental features like structural complexity, denser vegetation, getting re uh, reducing sealed pavement, uh, and things like this, more wild plant resources year round in areas, uh, <clears throat> not only in agricultural areas, but especially in urban areas. And we got an urban oasis project going with a colleague in order to create more insect friendly urban landscapes. So again, we think about rewilding Europe, a new beginning for wildlife. The rewilding network has to think about insects, plants and microclimate. When you think that this, uh, this outstanding little book in the Naturalist Handbook series by Unwin and Corbett was published 33 years ago. It shows you we are aware of it then, the importance of microclimates. Well, with climate change and climatic extremes being so important, we have to consider them more now than ever. And that's the, this is fin finally brings me to where I was just four weeks ago when I was writing to David, I was in Cyprus. This is me on the left taking a selfie in Athalassa Park. I'm actually looking at microclimates under rocks. I rolled about 300 rocks a day on myself, on my own, including ones about this big right down. And I'm really looking at how the microclimate temperature affects the prevalence of centipedes, giant Mediterranean centipedes, Scolopendra cingulata, and these false widow spiders, Steatoda peculiana. I'm also going to be working a little bit with reptiles like, uh, like geckos and lizards and skinks. But this is the landscape where I'm doing experiment. I'm going back in July when it's going to be 40 degrees. But I can tell you, even in April, Whereas the temperature under a rock might be 15 degrees, two meters away in the sunlight, it was over 55. So this tells you how important these microclimates are for these arthropods. They don't like heat any more than, than species maybe in temperate biomes do, but, they, but they, they stay where they are because the winter temperature is mild enough for them. But they, are, they can be seriously harmed by extreme heat. And the Mediterranean is warming. Cyprus is warming at a very rapid rate and they're getting a lot of days over 40 degrees. So these refuges are life and death for these invertebrates. And these are the last people I like to thank. I thank uh, Robin Heinen, Maddie Thakur, Rita Calls, Yacinth Ellers, Iris Sharon Lambadu, Salit Gusell, and Osga Ogden in uh, Cyprus, the last three in Cyprus who are working with me on some of these problems. And that is my talk. Thank you very much.